You know him from the Terry and Jesse show, and I have, with great admiration, I'm able to welcome Jesse Romero to our San Diego event. So I'm going to talk to all of you today on why the Catholic Church is great. Because we hear a lot of negative stuff, anti-Catholics in this country, propaganda, and also just some of the sins of the Catholic Church. I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to share with you at least two dozen things that make the Roman Catholic Church totally unique, unlike any other religion on planet Earth. Here's the first one I want to share with you. The Catholic Church, first of all, was started by the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so I'm going to share, share with you the greatness. When the Catholic Church is followed, and when a life of holiness is pursued, and when people live in a state of grace, the Catholic Church produces amazing feats in history. Here's the first one. The Catholic Church built the college, college and university system. The very first university was built by the Catholic Church in the 9th century in Salerno, Italy. When I talk to young people, they say, I used to be Catholic, but then I went to college and I studied science and now I'm not Catholic. <laughs> I say, did you know that it was the Catholic Church that gave us the discipline of science? It was the Catholic Church that built the first university in the ninth century, and from there, the university systems just spread around Europe like wildfire. So higher education is the brainchild of the Roman Catholic Church. Here's another one. Hospitals. Have you ever been sick? I've been sick. Hospitals were started by the Catholic Church. Under the Roman emperors, the only people that can see a doctor were the wealthy, were the rich. Doctors would make home visits. But pagan Rome didn't have hospitals. When pagan Rome and, and Greece had, the empire before that, they had resorts, hot springs, spas, gyms. <laughs> and the only people that had access to a doctor were the rich, the wealthy. They would pay a tent, they would make a home visit. At the time of Christ, people would come up to Jesus and ask him for healing. Remember the centurion? The Roman centurion, which he's the leader of a hundred soldiers. He says, Lord, I have a servant who's sick. Why didn't he take him to the hospital? Because there was no hospitals. <laughs> Jesus Christ healed him. It was the example of Jesus and the words of Jesus when you were sick. When I was sick, you visited me. It was those words that little by little, when Emperor Constantine, right around the year 313 AD, had a conversion to Catholic Christianity, and he signed a, uh, an executive order, <clears throat> an edict called the Edict of Milan in 314 AD, the Catholic Church now had religious liberty. Because of this, because of Emperor Constantine, What's the first thing the Catholic Church started doing? Taking these pagan Roman buildings and pagan Greek buildings and turning them into hospitals. The word hospital is a Latin word which means a guest house. There was actually a wealthy widow by the name of Saint Fabiola. She was a widow. Her husband left her a boatload of money. And so she talked to the emperor and she said, uh, my husband left me a lot of money, and she was a, a very pious Catholic. And she says, the words of Jesus cut me in the heart, where he says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was you know, thirsty, you gave me the drink. When I was sick, you visited me. She said, I'd like to use all my money to start building these edifices, buy these edifices that are closing down all over 
roam and turn them to places where we can give the sick some comfort, spiritual and physical comfort. And so the hospital system was started by the Roman Catholic Church after 314 AD. And a lot of it was done by the, the money of uh, initially of St. Fabiola. I was talking to some kids the other day. They're having an LGBT rally over in Phoenix, Arizona. So I went to, as a counter protester, uh, speaking the truth in charity. And so I shared it with them. They, they said, you're a Catholic? Well, they saw my crucifix. I said, yes. And you guys hate the LGBT, LGBT community. I said, really? I said, have you ever read what the Catholic Church says about homosexuals? In paragraph 2358. It says homosexual persons are called to be treated with compassion and with care, uh, you know, for their disorders. It is the most loving paragraph I've ever seen in my life in regards to how to treat people that have same-sex attractions. But I did tell these young kids. There's about two dozen of them. I said, but you know what Muslims do with you guys? You can go on YouTube. They throw you off the roof with your hands tied behind your back, head first. Or they cut your head off. I said, that's what they do. And in fact, in case you didn't know, young people, 25% of people that are dying right now of AIDS are being treated for free in Catholic AIDS hospices. That's, what, that's how we treat homosexuals. We care for their body and soul as they're about to die because of their disordered lifestyle. 25%, one out of four homosexuals, is being treated for free in a Catholic AIDS hospice. That's what we do. That's how we roll. Here's another one. Orphanages. Most people don't realize that the Catholic Church started orphanages. See, this is my next book. Okay, so I'm giving you, these are the bullet points. This is my next book. I'm going to, I'm going to preach this till I drop dead because I'm going to give you the pearls of Catholicism that most people don't know. Okay. The orphanages were started by the Catholic Church. In the letter of James, I think it's James chapter 1, I forget what verse. James, the, the cousin of our Lord Jesus Christ, says that we are called to take care of widows and orphans. So that's a biblical mandate. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this man's religion is in vain. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. James 1, 26-27. Now, here's what would happen in pagan Greece and in pagan Rome. Both of them had uh, alpha men. The Greeks had Athens and Spartans, and the Romans had the, the legionnaires. What those men would do when they're wife would have a baby boy they would the, the man the husband would look at their son and he would determine if this son was going to make a good spartan or a good roman legionnaire if the father determined that he's going to make a good soldier they would raise him like a pet bull and teach him to fight but if the boy had any type of defects any type of defects the greek fathers and the roman fathers would take their sons and throw them in the trash. This is history. They said, ah, Down syndrome, throw that one in the trash. Ah, club foot, throw that one in the trash. That was common. That's what the pagans did with their boys who they determined were not going to grow up and be great fighters. Well, what happened? The Catholics at night that were basically, you know, living uh, underground in the catacombs, you know, uh, there was an underground church under the pagan Roman emperors. The Catholics would hear the babies crying in the trash cans and in the dumps. And the Catholics would go out there and pick up the babies and take them home and raise them. Catholic orphanages were started by individual Catholics that would pick up Greek and Roman babies from the trash and raise them to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And from then on, it became institutionalized in the fourth century once Emperor Constantine lifted the uh, 
the religious persecution of Catholics and he gave us religious liberty, then it became more institutionalized and annexed with the church. Here's another one. Did you know that Catholics had the lowest suicide rate in the country? Ah, oh, let me preface that. Let me preface that. Let me go back. Practicing Catholics <laughs> have the lowest suicide rate in the country. I learned this 30 years ago. I'm reading some, uh, some of, one of my wife's nursing books from some of her professors from Southern California, UCLA, USC, big shots, secular. And she was she came home 30 some odd years ago. Look at what I learned in nursing school. I said, what, what? She goes, Catholics have the lowest suicide. So I read it. I'm like, wow, secular studies from USC and UCLA. These doctors, three doctors said, Catholics have the lowest suicide rate because they have an advantage because they have this, <coughs> this system called <coughs> confession which gives them an advantage because other religions don't have the ability to to feel redeemed and to feel you know uh, th this guilt that they carry lifted they don't they just go around and say oh, I accept that Jesus is Lord and Savior I said the sinner's prayer but they go back in the room they're so depressed Catholicism is an incarnational religion you hear a priest he raises his hand you hear the words of Christ and you know you're forgiven because that ambassador for Christ with the authority of Christ and the person of Christ has forgiven your sins. This is why practicing Catholics have the lowest, side, lowest suicide rate in the United States of America. You know who has the highest suicide rate in the United States of America? Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. I'm talking about religion. Highest. Okay? These are just, these is what, what, this is what the studies bear. Here's another one most people don't realize that Catholics developed the idea of free market economics. It was in the early part of the church, way over a thousand years ago, where the Cistercians and Catholic monks, remember, a thousand years ago, there was not a lot of big cities. Most Catholics grew up in an agrarian culture. And so it was the monks that taught Catholics, hey, buy a few acres, grow these crops, and then you can sell them and make a profit and you can feed your family. That was that free market system of economics was taught by Catholic monks to lay people well over a thousand years ago. How do they profit growing things in your property? Here's another one. Western law, which was which is used in our courts right now, in our, in our criminal civil courts, it grew out of church law. If you've ever been to court in our American court system, our American court system is replete with Latin terms. Yeah. That's more dire than jury. Rid of habeas corpus. Uh, everything the judge and the attorneys, all the big legal speak, it's all Latin terms. Why? They borrowed those terms from Catholic canon law. Our law grew from Western Catholic law. And so you'll find lawyers and even the medical community. All these fancy terms are Latin. The language of intelligentsia. Here's another one. Practicing Catholics have the lowest divorce rate in the United States of America. I said practicing, I didn't say Catholics. Okay? Non fake Catholics like you know somebody in the White House and uh, the governor's <laughs> mansion. Fake Catholics. Fake Catholics. Have a high, as, as high a divorce rate as uh, you know secular humanists than anybody else. Practicing Catholics, Dr. Janet Smith wrote her PhD thesis in this 30 years ago. Practicing Catholics have a less than 4.2 percent divorce rate. Yeah, less than. And, and, and I'll, let me give you a secret. A secret. Uh, one of the components of bringing your divorce rate that low is try to find at least one time a day where you pray together spouses pray together whether it's morning prayer or an evening prayer or the 12 room angelus or the divine mercy at three find a time to pray together that's one of the key principles to to going down to that category of less than 4.2 percent divorce rate here's another one did you know that music was almost entirely controlled by the Catholic Church up until about 100 years ago? For about 1,900 years, <clears throat> when you track the music from the time of Christ to about the 19th century, most of the music was controlled by the Roman Catholic Church, church music. You know, the Protestants also you know, obviously you know, broke off from us 
almost 500 years ago, but they maintain some beautiful church music, you know, in their own, uh, in their, in their own traditions, Lutherans, you know, high, uh, Episcopalians, Anglicans. But it wasn't until about 100 years ago that music became what, what we would call secular or profane. And what has happened? Because as a result of the music taking a left turn, it's had a huge negative impact on the culture. I'll give you an example. I grew up uh, in a suburb of Los Angeles. In the 70s, I was, uh, you know, I was a youngster. I was a, a teenager. In the 80s, I was a young man. I grew up in, in where I grew up in. I grew up on some of the most beautiful black music of that era. Lionel Richie, yeah. Al Green. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross. Uh, this, this, mu this is the music. It was music that promoted love. The new black artists that, that, are, that are, have come out since the 90s and 2000s absolutely have destroyed the black culture. Music has a powerful effect on the imagination. And now, the lyrics that they're putting out now, wicked, destructive, evil, diabolical. Did you know that Catholics were the first to abolish slavery? The oldest document that I've discovered was in the fourth century, St. Patrick of Ireland, an exorcist of the Bishop of Ireland. He wrote to the Irish Catholics, a Catholic cannot own a slave. This was 1,600 years ago when everybody practiced slavery. Everybody. And in Africa too. Who is how was slavery practiced in Africa? Blacks enslaved blacks. Yes. Tribalism. Yes. Mm -hmm. when, the, when the white settlers went to Africa, who did they buy the slaves from? Black slave owners. Yes. Everybody practiced slavery. Everybody. Who was the first one that started speaking out against it? The Catholic Church. 300, 400 years before Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, there's at least two or three popes that's in the 14th century, 15th century, and 16th century that already spoke about Catholics can never own a slave. Three popes in the Middle Ages, St. Patrick in the 4th century. We as Catholics have done more to, and I'll tell you who really abolished slavery, the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus, little by little, dissolved the institution of slavery. Because when Jesus says things like, Love one another as I have loved you. Uh, those words reverberate throughout time. St. Paul's letter to Philemon. Philemon, uh, who was a slave owner. Onesimus, his slave. Paul says, yeah, at the time of the Roman, under Roman law, you can kill your slave if he runs away from you. Paul said, I've evangelized him, I've baptized him. He's a Christian now. He's one of us. You're a Christian as well. When he comes back, don't treat him like a slave, treat him like a brother. Yes. It was New Testament theology that dissolved the institution of slavery. What about the just war doctrine? The Catholic Church is very aware that there's always going to be wicked men that are greedy, avaricious, and, they, and, and, and power hungry, and they're gonna enact war. And you have rich companies, what I would call the industrial war complex, mm -hmm. of wicked CEOs, Lockheed, Northrop, Boeing, and, uh, and uh, Black Black. <laughs> the, these are, these CEOs, it's a business to them, who goes to war. Poor whites, blacks, and Hispanics, not their kids. And so the Catholic Church is realistic, she always knows that men are, are going to be wicked because there's evil in the, in, in the heart of man. So St. Augustine 1,600 years ago wrote a document called the Just War Theory. Basically telling nations these are the do's and don'ts. This is the way you regulate this. You don't attack women. You don't firebomb cities. You don't torture people. And so it was the Catholic Church's mighty pen by, by St. Bishop Augustine of Hippo that basically has given a template to the entire world of a doctrine called the Just War Doctrine. And guess what? This is something that's been accepted 
by every country in the world except the 51 Muslim countries. They're saying, no, a Christian won't that, we're not going to follow it. But all the other countries say, yeah, you're right. You can't torture people. You can't take women prisoners. You can't take children prisoners. You can't firebomb a city. Everybody else has signed off on the just war doctrine written by the Catholic Church except Islam. So this is a cool one for guys. Most of the men here have seen Gladiator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I watched it. Uh -huh. Cool movie. I think there's a lot of, of, of good good things uh, that there's there's virtue there in the midst of all the violence. But a lot of people don't realize. Well, how did the gladiator matches stop? Here's where they stopped. People don't know the as Paul Harvey says. This is the end of the story. There was a monk in the fourth century. His name was Telemachus. Telemachus. We call him Saint Telemachus. The Lord spoke to him in a locution and said, Telemachus, go to Rome. He's in a monastery. He's living the life of a monk about 60 miles away from Rome. Telemachus says, Lord, in prayer, he hears God saying, go to Rome. Go to Rome. He says, me? I'm a monk. What do you want me to do in Rome? I'm giving over to a consecrated life of prayer and fasting. Go to Rome. He fixes up a little satchel, puts it on a stick, and he takes off to Rome. He gets to Rome on a Saturday, and he sees all these people running into the Roman Colosseum. The Roman Colosseum holds about 80,000 people. So he walks and he asks some of the people, where's everybody going? Don't you know? Today's the day of the games. Today's when the gladiators kill for the glory of Caesar. And he said, Lord, is this me to come to Rome? How am I going to stop this killing machine? Telemachus walks into the Colosseum and he looks. 80,000 pagans chanting for blood. The gladiators march out. The gladiators, a lot of them were slaves as well. And they walk right in front of the Caesar. The Caesar is there with his wife. He has his, his royal courtroom around. Caesar walks out to the parapet. The gladiators march up to, to the Caesar, look up to him, tap their heart with their swords and say, we die for the glory of Caesar. <clears throat> Telemachus says, Lord, why did you bring me here? What, what can I do? I'm just a monk. <laughs> Telemachus says, I've got to do something. And he jumped out into the pit, it's about a 20 foot drop, jumped down into the pit, wiped his tunic off and ran up right underneath the parapet and looked at the emperor. All the gladiators were in, 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 in file and columns right behind him. He walks up and he says to the Caesar, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop the killing. The Caesar, the emperor looks at him and says, what? <laughs> Who is this guy? Get this guy off the field. One of the gladiators takes out his sword, walks up to St. Telemachus with the back of the sword. He slams him in the chest. So Telemachus bends over, slam the blade hitting him in the chest. He rolls over backward. He gets up. He's had the wind knocked out of him. He runs up again right underneath the parapet and he looks at the emperor and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop the killing. The emperor says, who is this little guy? <laughs> Then he said, run him through. The crowds began to chant, run him through, run him through, run him through. 80,000 people, run him through. A gladiator takes out a sword, walks up to Telemachus. A third time he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop the killing. One of the gladiators walks up in front of St. Telemachus, takes out a sword, sticks it right in his belly, comes out his back. Telemachus drops on the floor immediately in a pool of his own blood. He's in a supine position. He looks up at the emperor and he says, in the name of Jesus Amen. Christ, stop the killing. Amen. And he breathed his last breath. The emperor saw that. He snapped his fingers. His wife stood up, grabbed his arm, pulled his finger. He said, let's go. Called everybody out. Quietly, little by little, the Roman Colosseum started empty. Within 15 minutes, it was completely empty. There was one person left. St. Telemachus, Father Telemachus was in the middle of the Colosseum in a pool of his own blood. Who was there with him? Jesus Christ. The Roman emperor was so moved by the courage of this Catholic priest, he went to his room, he wrote a decree. And he said, no more gladiator killings 
in Rome. Really? Wow. This is how that institution that lasted 800 years stopped because there was a brave Catholic priest that was willing to give his life wow. in the name of Jesus. Wow. This is the greatness of Catholicism. When Catholicism is lived, it is the most powerful force in the world. And this is why the devil knows. The devil doesn't fear the Democrats or the Republicans or the Greenpeace Party or, uh, you know, Mexico Pri or Pan or, you know. The, the devil fears the Catholic Church. It is the bride of Christ. It is the one true church. It is the Catholic Church's authority and her teachings, which are perfect. Not the people. We're all sinners. Okay? We're sinners. The church's teachings are absolutely perfect because it's the doctrine of Christ. And as Catholics, what does the devil fear? The fact that in every Catholic church, Jesus Christ becomes present. Amen. Jesus Christ becomes present. This is why, and I've, I've talked to Satanists and witches. I've interviewed them on radio. I've talked to them in person. They've told me, Satanists and witches have told me, we don't fear Islam. It's a fake religion. We don't fear Protestants. They have no power. We don't fear Jews. It's an obsolete religion. Our enemies is the Catholic Church. Satanists and witches will tell you that because they know the church, the only church where God comes down and becomes present on that altar. It's our church. And this is a church that again is targeted for extermination by the enemy. Remember this, the devil has an expiration date. <laughs> he has an expiration date. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10, the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes back, the Bible says he will get the Antichrist, the Satan, and the false prophet, and he will throw them into hell and seal hell up forever. Satan knows that he has an expiration date. Revelation chapter 12 verse 12. The Bible says that Satan says he knows that his time is short. Mm -hmm. Now, in Luke chapter 1, the Bible tells us about Jesus. And it says, the Son of God who will rule on Jacob's throne, his kingdom will last forever and ever and ever. There is no expiration date to the kingdom of Christ, Amen. which is the Catholic Church. Amen. And there is an expiration date to Satan's kingdom. When Christ comes back, it's over. And the last thing I'll say is this, no surprise to any of you, there's no religion that's more pro-life than the Catholic faith. In fact, Roe versus Wade was toppled because of Catholics, not because of Protestants, not because of Jews, or because of, because of Catholics. Catholics have been praying outside abortion clinics since 1973. They've been picketing. They've been uh, writing to their legislators, to their politicians. And it was ultimately Catholic Supreme Court justice that gave it the death knell. This hideous institution, institution of killing babies for Satan, because that's what it is. You talk to any Satanists. I've talked to the highest ranking Satanists in America. His name is Lucian Greaves. He's the Pope of the Church of Satan in America. He's told me in conversation. He says, for us, abortion is a blood sacrifice to our father Satan. And so they've said, we'll do anything. Lobby. They're involved politically. They lock arms with the Democrat Party. They're saying, Lucian Greaves told me, to take away abortion would be the equivalent of the government taking away the Catholic mass for you. Because you offer the unbloody sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, back to God the Father at every Mass. That's the theology of the Mass. Satanists will tell you, we offer the bloody sacrifice of a baby to our father Satan. For them, it is the equivalent for them of the Mass. It's a sacramental blood sacrifice. But it's Catholics that topple this wicked institution. But we're going to be fighting this battle until the second coming of Christ because now the Democrats... Now they're fighting this from state to state since they lost federally. And as Catholics, we're, we've just begun. Here's the last couple of things I shared this with. A, I said, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith, life would be kind of boring in America. Look at some of the things that Jesus gives us through the Catholic Church 
which enriches culture, which brings joy. Who doesn't like Christmas? Christmas lights, Christmas trees, neighborhoods all lit up. The music on the radio, the music in the malls. Who gave us that? Buddha? Confucius? Muhammad? Jesus did. Amen. Christmas is about the birth of Christ. That beautiful time and season where people come together could only be done by the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God. Everything about this country that is great comes from Jesus. Even New Year's, people had New Year's parties, January 1st, 2023. What is the reference for New Year's? The birth of Christ. 2,023 years A.D. Anno Domini, which means in Latin, from the year, from the birth of our Lord Jesus. We know the date today because it's referenced from Jesus' calendar. What about Valentine's Day? Beautiful day. It was a Catholic priest in the third century, Father Valentine. He was promoting authentic Christian love in the streets of Rome. Amongst the kids, just like this generation, fornicating, confused, sexually disordered. And he was preaching the truth about sacramental married love. He was thrown in prison by the emperor. He kept on preaching in prison. He was killed in prison by the emperor for preaching the truth about sacramental Catholic marriage. In fact, Father Valentine, the tradition tells us he would write letters and pigeons would come to his jail cell to the window and they would take these little notes that he write, little love letters. They fly out, they drop the love letters, and they fall down. People say, oh, what's that? that fell off the sky. They pick it up and it was the Bible verse written by Father Valentine to the young people in Rome. St. Valentine's Day, we celebrated as Catholics because that was the death of a Catholic priest that had the guts to tell the truth about true love and pure love. Easter, what is Easter? Federal holiday, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's a game changer, let me tell you something. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's the game changer because the last I checked, Buddha's tomb is occupied with his body. Confucius' tomb is occupied with his body. Abraham, Moses, Zoroaster, etc., etc. Their tombs are occupied with their body. There is an empty tomb. The most visited tomb in the world is in Jerusalem. It's the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, his resurrection is a game changer. Jesus Christ's resurrection makes life worth living. And Jesus Christ's resurrection, one day we can look at death and say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your power against me? For the sting of death is the law. But thanks be to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, He has given us new life. And finally, here's something else a lot of people don't realize. The Catholic Church helped out the Jews more than any other religion or national leader by far. Pope Pius XII should be Saint Pius XII. When the world was silent, Pope Pius XII hid under his pontificate 800,000 Jews, dressed them as nuns, dressed them as priests, as seminarians, hid them in basins, hid them in attics. The Jews to this day, there's a field in Jerusalem and it's called the Field of the Gentiles. The Jews, back in the 40s, after World War II was over, they planted 800 trees there. And the Jews called Pope Pius XII the righteous Gentile. That field is dedicated to him, and every tree represents a thousand Jews that he saved. The Jews write, Rabbi Lapid and others say, this Pope single-handedly saved 800,000 Jews from extermination. Wow. The Catholic Church, has been, in fact, there was a, a very famous Jew in Rome named Rabbi Zoili. He was so moved by the, the charity and the courage of Pope Pius XII. Rabbi Zoili, who was a rabbi for 45 years, an expert in Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, Rabbi Zoili, after World War II, was baptized in the Catholic Church by Pope Pius XII. <laughs> The church gave us science. The church built the first telescope. The church gave us the Holy Bible. The church built the first printing press. Well, I can go on and on. You're gonna love this book when it comes out. This book is gonna make you. It's gonna make you proud to be Catholic. 
It's going to give you the answers. So when you talk to non-Catholic friends, say, did you know? Did you know? They're going to say, what? You're going to give people an intellectual charity horse. <laughs> but this is, see, what I'm sharing with you is this is the glory of Catholicism. The church can only produce this because it's the bride of Christ. Amen. 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 We're done. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's about one out of 13 popes is a bad pope. Having a satan. Jesus picked 12 apostles, one out of 12 was bad. So we're batting right around the, you know, the Jesus' percentage of bad apostles. We're right around there. One out of 13 popes has been bad. We've had 19 bad popes, but Jeff didn't speak. I doubt we're going on that topic. It shouldn't scandalize Catholics. We've been here before. But the reason people are scandalized by Pope Francis is because... <laughs> Well, I have about 200 years person. of good books. Probably was. So we're not used to this. Um, but uh, but objectively but speaking, they're a lovely, a lovely congregation. Pope Francis, very strong, strong he's a modernist, which means, and yeah. you can see what he writes and when he talks. So he has a, more, a modernist Catholic is somebody who has more of a natural view of everything. Like, let's fix the planet, let's take, you know, plastic out of the ocean, let's recycle. There. This is a natural view of the cosmos. He doesn't have a, a supernatural view of the cosmos, like Paul Benedict, John Paul II. Uh, his emphasis is on, uh, again, building bridges with the LGBT community. And, and uh, you know, Paul Schwab and Bill Gates. Near Boeing Field. His emphasis is the Pope should be the salvation of souls. The congregation is very small. Maybe Jesus died for our sins on the cross. And that, that should be the message from Pope Francis. But a lot of it's not his fault because they he's a Jesuit. The Jesuits in the last it was century have basically lost their supernatural faith and they become theological modernists. I can prove this to you. You can tell a priest is a modernist. He just passed when they away say at 90 about the stories of Jesus Christ multiplying loaves and, uh, and fishes, and they say, and oh, by the way, uh, this Jesus that found really the didn't yes, and perform a miracle. The what happened is that Jesus' words were so a, impactful well, that the people, a, it opened their hearts and they became generous, and they had fish and, 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 and loaves Portland underneath Korea. their tunics, and they started and sharing because they heard the message. Guess what? Santa Pope Francis gave that homily a few years ago. I don't know. It's in the Vatican. What are the five? He actually yeah. said that. Yeah, absolutely. He's a modernist. Okay. He, so, why, he's been, he's been trained by the Jesuits. The Jesuits have, in the last hundred years, they have went from being the, the Navy SEALs of the Catholic Church. They are now the uh, theological modernists and liberals and Catholicism, and they've lost their faith. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Our Lady Lord of the Village, which will run by a Jesuit priest. There's some that are still good, but again, the ones in high positions, like, for example, Father Sosa, he's a top Jesuit in the room. He says, there's no devil. Father James Martin, Jesuit. He says we got to get rid of the, we got to change the catechism and allow homosexual, uh, remove paragraph 2357 about homosexuality being a disorder. The biggest troublemakers in the world right now are Jesuits. They lost their faith. They're not supposed to be popes either. They take a vow not to be a, not ever to be a pope. That's why uh, Pope Francis well, says he's only the Bishop of Rome. Yeah, he and won't wear the red shoes. He won't say he's a pope. He won't sign it. He calls himself the Bishop of Rome. Yeah, I guess. They all moved out to Arizona. When I did. I moved seven years ago. What part of Arizona? I moved from I moved from here seven years ago. Because you were in LA, right? I live in city, the city of San Fernando. It's in the suburb, it's a suburb of, of, of LA. I moved seven years ago. Um, 
and I told my kids, I said, you guys, if you guys get married, start having kids, you better move to a friendlier state. Now, when I moved out here, we had a great governor, we had a great sheriff, and a great bishop. That's all pastors. Now we have a horrible governor, and she stole the election. Now we have a liberal sheriff, a George Soros sheriff, but now we have a pro-LGBT bishop. So when I moved seven years ago, I moved into America, and now it's just the extension of California. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's all it is now. When did you when did you retire as a policeman? Two thousand and three. I worked twenty two years in the sheriff's LAPD? department. LA no, sheriff. Sure. Uh -huh. Was there like a defining moment where you just became just completely inflamed with love of the Lord? Was it like gradual? I was already a, a Jesus living Catholic for many years as a cop. But uh, I got in an auto accident, pushed my hip, got a hip replacement, so the sheriff said, well, you can't, you can't uh, technically work the streets if you have a prosthetic body part. Right. So he said, you want a desk job or you want to get an early retirement? I said, I'll take an early retirement. And I'm going to, he goes, what are you going to go do? I said, I'm going to go preach the Catholic faith. It was Sheriff, it was Sheriff Block. He was a Jew. I said, oh, I'm going to talk about your Jewish Messiah. I said, yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. He laughed. He said, "Did you convert him?" I've had I had good conversations with him, and uh, I, you know, I just dropped seeds. You know, all you can do is just drop seeds, and God will do the rest. That's right? He did. What? Um, how did it start? Yes. What happened is when I used to take people to jail. I worked East LA in my last ten years, and when I would take people to jail, I was arresting Catholics every day. That's all I was arresting. They make the worst criminals sometimes. I worked East LA and South Central. Yeah. And so when I go to jail and stuff, when I take them to the booking cage, I would book them, you know, do everything. I'm supposed to take the picture, fingerprints. I say, now that we did all that, now I've done all my job. I said, now I'm going to take you to your jail cell, give you a lunch. Here's your jumpsuit, put it on. And I want to talk to you about Jesus. You want to hear about him? You're just arresting me. Yeah, I know. I did what I had to do. You can't, the credit, yeah. I want to talk to you about Jesus. You want, you want to hear about him? Absolutely. And so I did that for years. Uh, the captain would call me into the office. Jesse, said, get off. People are complaining you're talking about Jesus to the prisoners. Oh, sorry, Captain. I won't do it again. I did it all the time. I did it for 10 years. I just, you know, no, 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 Captain. I won't do it again. And so that's the way it started, basically. I would get a priest would call me up and said, hey, can I speak with Officer Romero? Yeah. Hey, you arrested uh, so-and-so. Yeah, he, he got cocaine in his pocket. He had a stolen gun. Well, that's not why I called. <coughs> I called him because he, he, he called me from the jail. <coughs> and he told me that you prayed with him. That's the one we tell you. Yeah, I do, I do that for most of the guys. Please don't say When's your day off? Tuesday and Wednesday? Uh, can you come and talk to my confirmation class? Sure. Oh. <coughs> can you come and talk to my RCA class? So arresting people, they would call their pastors. And they would say, this guy prayed with me. And this guy... This I would give a little divine mercy cards and how to pray the rosary. Right? Give them to him. <coughs> and I tell him, hey, when you go to prison, check into RCIA, talk to the Catholic chapter, get into Catholic Bible study. Police would call me up and invite me to go speak. They say, you just arrested my parishioner. Yeah, Father, here's, here's his $25,000 bail. That's not why I called you. I called her and asked him, Mm -hmm. when, you, when you off? I'm off Thursday and Friday this month. Can you come and talk to my youth group? My, my parishioner are in jail. He was so moved by the way you treated him. I said, sure. Brother. That's how it started. I, just, I never thought I was going to be doing this. But I just, when I fell in love with Jesus, and I fell in love with Jesus at the age of 12, I'm 61. I fell in love with Jesus, I fell in love with Jesus at 26 years old in, the, in a police car. As I'm, as I'm looking at the chaos in East LA, among most Catholics, Latinos, and gangs, I'm saying, this life is crap. There's got to be something more. And so I'd go home at the end of PM shift, 
when I, my mom would, actually my mom and dad say, mijo, start reading the Bible. You gotta get to know Jesus. I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. Man. So I listened to my mom and dad. At 26, I said, all right, who is this Jesus guy? I mean, I'm Catholic, I go to Mass every Sunday, there's statues and images, but who is he? So, I just, I said, I'm not stupid, I can make up my mind. If this story's bullshit, then I'm out of here. But if, this, if there's something to this story, then, then, I'm, then I gotta jump in feet first. And so, I just began reading, as a young man, the Gospels every night when I'd get home. And I can just tell you, the story of Jesus Christ is absolutely true. There is nothing more true than Jesus. And I said, I'm in. Sign me up. I want to follow you forever. Uh, every, when you read the Gospels, all of us are born with a bullshit meter. We know when people are bullshitting us. Okay? We do. Ante our antennas go up. <laughs> It's, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a bullshit meeting. We know when we're hearing lies. <laughs> and at 26, as I'm reading the gospel, I'm saying, wow, he is amazing. And he walked upon the earth, and he started the Catholic faith, and he died for my sins. All of those things started, like, exploding in my heart. And I said, wow, I'm going to make it a point that anybody I arrest at this point, that's open, I'm not going to force it on anybody, but anybody that's open, I'm going to share my love of Jesus Christ with them. And so that's how it started. And that's how somebody recorded me at a parish, you know, my day off. I went to go speak, I think, like, at a youth group. And the pastor recorded me in a cassette tape. And a cassette tape for me? Yeah. And he goes, this is good. He sent it to Mother Angelica. Mother Angelica called me up and said, hey, you, Jesse, remember the L.A. cop? I said, yeah. And they go, I got a cassette tape, young man. He's giving a I said, I want to meet you. Yeah. I said, me? Me? You? Yeah. So she flew me out to EWTN. Oh, that's good. That's good. And I did several programs with her. No, I'm fine. And so that's how, when I got in an accident and crushed my hip and got a hip replacement, and the sheriff says, we'll give you a desk job for the next eight years. That we'll was you, your sign. Oh, we'll get it. I said, okay, Lord, Lord yeah. this is... This is my sign that you want me to now preach the gospel. That's right. You're in it now full time. And Mother Angelica had a lot to do with it. Because when she put me on her, on her TV show, which was, I started getting phone calls from all over the country. Yeah. And we were talking, she was saying that you had a good uh, command of the scripture passages. That's one of the things our Protestant brothers and sisters are so good at rattling off the numbers. And uh, that was pretty. Now, do you actually have to. So you have to knack for remembering the numbers, the verse numbers, yeah, the chapters, and that's, yeah. that's what my, it is. My wife says I have a gift. Yeah. I can be, like she just, you got the gift of recall. Yeah. So that's great. I guess I do. Because yeah. when I read something, and if I like it, it sticks. It sticks. It sticks like calling. Yeah. Everybody. You can't live on planet Earth without any kind of evil spirits. And so I just wrote about uh, a lot of things that I've seen. But also how they came in here. They've come in here through the witchcraft, Santa Muerte, Santeria, uh, Satanism. These things are very popular right now. Because and they're, they're promoted through television, through music, through media. And so, um, this is what we're dealing with. And it's all over. It's all over. It's, the Hollywood is replete with this. Most of the Hollywood people, the, the A-list actors, they're Satanists or Luciferians or Freemasons. So, I went down. We just, and that's what I wrote about. We just have some very, very bad people in high places right now that openly worship Satan. Go down. Those are those are physical attacks upon your body by an evil spirit, and the way it feels, it feels like you can't get up. There's something on top of you, and it's very heavy, and you can't get up, and you want to wake up because at the same time you're having a nightmare. Because it was there's a difference between a nightmare and a night terror. A nightmare is when you're in full full REM sleep. Okay. Uh, 
that's when when you have when you're in full deep sleep. Excuse me, that's called a nightmare. When you're half asleep, half awake, and you have a, a, an attack, a mental attack, that's called a night terror. Those are caused by demons. This is the Bible. This is this is right in Scripture. Demons attack the mind. And they also attack the body. And they're more active at night because night reminds them of hell. Hell, hell is pure darkness. There's no light in hell. And so demons feel very comfortable attacking at night because that's that's their, again, that's just their comfort zone. So obsession, OB, those are mental attacks. Oppression, OP, those are physical attacks. And they're done by evil spirits. And this is in the Bible. And this is well, part of Catholic tradition. I Yeah, yeah. It happens. Like you think of Padre Pio. Yeah, it happens to all of us. It doesn't matter what your state in life is. Of course, if you're living an evil life, it's easier because they're attracted to people that are living wicked, evil lives. But uh, even if you're trying to live a, a good Catholic faith and a good pure life, there's going to be these uh, occasional attacks. Why? Because the, the goal of a demon is to get the human person to fall into mortal sin, stay there, not repent, become hardened in their disposition, and die and go to hell. Because the demon that tempts you, if a person dies in unrepentant, unconfessed sin, that demon that uh, caused you to, to fall into sin and go to hell, that's the demon that will torture you forever in hell. And so they look at all this like red meat. They look at all this like, okay, he could be my slave forever. He could be my slave forever. And so uh, this is why they tempt us because we become their perpetual victims and prostitutes in hell. They do whatever they want. Live close to Jesus. As Catholics, we call live in a state of grace. Stay close to Jesus and Mary, because those are the two uh, people that the, the devil fears. Fears Jesus and fears Mary. So, as a Catholic, as long as we live close to our Lord and Our Lady, we're protected. Doesn't mean you're not going to get occasional bodily temptation. Of course, we are. We're human beings. We have a fallen nature. But living in a state of grace, staying close to Jesus and Our Lady, is a sure sign of protection.